Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Introduction to the Psychology of Bilingualism and Multilingualism. I am Dr. Arkwarma from the Department of Cognitive Sciences at IIT Kanpur. And in this lecture, I am going to continue talking about speech production processes in bilinguals and multilinguals. In the previous lecture, we talked about the fact that during bilingual word production, activation of semantic nodes and phonological nodes may be language non-selective. However, the selection for production, basically what words we are going to actually produce is language selective and that may be one of the reasons why as bilinguals we do not feel a lot of interference from the non-target language when we decide to speak in a particular manner or when we decide to speak in a particular language sorry. Now so far we have considered evidence from the picture word interference task. In today's lecture we will talk about similar results from the simple picture naming task where there is no distractor only a picture is presented. And basically what we are going to see here or what we are going to investigate in terms of the evidence is whether phonological encoding actually happens for the translation of a presented picture's name in the non-target language. Remember, for example, I am presenting you the picture of the word apple and whether the sounds sir and ba are also getting activated because it is a translational equivalent of the picture and I have been told to name this picture in English. That is basically what we are going to look at. Now, if we are able to present evidence for the same, uh, we are basically speaking for the models that advocate some kind of a cascaded flow of activation and on the other hand, uh, the contrary evidence would support the discrete two-stage models. Remember when we uh, started talking about this, we looked at a uh, you know, discrete model like levels Weaver plus plus model and we also sort of considered an alternative uh, you know processing uh, uh, assumption which was uh, materialized in Dell's spreading activation model which basically assumes cascaded activation among stages. Now to investigate this fact, Costa and colleagues used translation pairs of words that may or may not share phonology. Now if you have sort of, if you are a bilingual, if you know uh, and speak two or two more than two languages, you would uh, you would basically be aware of the fact that in some in some cases or uh, a lot of words across two or three languages actually share uh, the phonology as well as meaning. These words are called cognates. Say, for example, the words uh, gat and gato in Spanish basically are the representations of the picture cat. And you can see that they share a large part of their phonologies as well as their meaning. These words are referred to as cognates. Say for example, in, in common parlance you might have uh, listened to the word mother, matr and so on which are cognates of each other because they share both phonology and meaning uh, with, uh, you know, with each other and they are words from different languages. However, there are also words that are translationally equivalents of each other like the Spanish uh, uh, misa and the cattle and taula which basically share the same meaning however the phonology is non-shared all right so these former types of words are referred to as cognates whereas the latter type of words are referred to as non-cognates now interestingly cognates and non-cognates have actually been used in a lot of picture naming studies in, with bilinguals because they allow us this chance of testing for uh, co-activation in cases where there is an actual phonological overlap between the two words even despite the fact that their language memberships are different. Now the idea that Costa and colleagues sort of were uh, running with was that if the activated lexical notes in the non-target language send act indeed send activation down to the phonological level, picture naming should be faster for cognates you know because they, they share phonology and it will become faster, it will become uh, easier for the system to sort of uh, you know there will be higher activation in those sublexical phonological components for cognates because they are receiving activation from both sides the uh, word and its translational equivalent. 
On the other hand, if a single lexical node is first selected from the set of activated nodes and that is the one that is being phonologically encoded and is going through the further process down as I showed in the levels model, only this node would be sending its activation down for the phonological level and then picture naming would be equally fast for both cognates and non-cognates. So these are the two things that we have to consider. Now indeed, picture naming in L2 Spanish by Catalan Spanish bilinguals was found faster for cognate pictures than for non-cognate pictures. What does it tell us? It tells us that there is some evidence of the fact that phonological encoding happens for non-target language uh, translational equivalence as well. These results or similar results have also been reported by uh, other studies using Dutch English bilinguals and Spanish English bilinguals. Now, in a different study, Costa and colleagues tested for the hypothesis that the amount of activation sent down uh, to the uh, you know, phonological sublexical level is proportional to the lexical node's activation level, basically saying that if the lexical node at the level of lexical selection is highly active, it will send down more activation to the phonological level. Say for example, if you are naming a word in a dominant language or let's say if your dominant language is the non-target language, it will be highly activated and it will send proportional activation down to the phonological level. Now even now at the phonological level, even though let's say the sounds of Hindi for example are not from the target language, they will be highly activated, they, they will be higher activation there even though your target language to speak or name the picture is English which is let's say not your dominant language. So, if this is indeed true, we would observe a larger cognate effect when the non-target language is the participant's dominant language, as I was saying, and as for this situation, a cognate target's sublexical representations would receive a larger activation from the lexical nodes of the translational equivalent. Indeed, the data confirmed this prediction as well, and researchers found larger cognate effects when pictures were to be named in the weaker language rather than in the dominant language of the participants. So now here we have evidence for the fact that there is some degree of phonological encoding for uh, a participant's non-target language as well. Now from these results, the authors interpreted that the pictures names were also phonologically encoded in the participants both languages. Also, these results provide support to the cascaded models of speech production wherein the activation at the highest level, as I was saying earlier, trickles down to the lowest levels as phonological encoding as well. So both types of models, unidirectional cas uh, cascaded models and interactive activation models or speech production are compatible with these results, although on the basis of uh, uh, you know uh, future study, Costa and colleagues showed their preference for the interactive model for speech production. Now, researchers have actually also in, uh, investigated the possibility of the different representations of cognates and non-cognates as a source for the cognate effects, which could suggest that the, uh, that the effects that we have just seen are observed uh, not because of phonological encoding, but because cognates are represented slightly differently in the mental representations. However, other studies have looked into this idea in some more detail. For example, Colomb uh, kept the participants in their study completely ignorant about the bilingual nature of the experiment and ensured that the non-target language was not present in any which way, similars, materials, uh, you know, environment, etc. in the setup in any way. So, Colomb utilized a version of the phony monitoring task first using the studies of monolingual speech perception. She adapted the task as a component of the picture naming task. Her participants who were cattle and Spanish bilinguals were presented with pictures for which they had to tacitly generate names and then monitor the presence of a particular sound. So in this sense, they will be shown pictures of which they don't have to really name them but tacitly generate names but monitor the for the presence of a particular noun. For example, uh, if uh, I am asking you to name the picture of a uh, vegetable, let's say mutter, I am basically asking you that, okay, I am showing you the picture of peas, I am asking you to sort of, you know, uh, uh, tacitly name this picture and uh, look for whether the sound ter comes here or not, okay. 
So, what she did was in her first experiment, participants were shown a letter on the screen and they were asked to transpose it mentally into a sound. So, they were shown a letter, let us say M, uh, P, B, etc., and they would say, okay, convert this into a sound. And they, they, they would do it. Oh, uh, L means L, P means, uh, P means P, etc. Uh, following that, the letter was removed from the screen and a picture was pr uh, presented which had to be named tacitly. And what the participants were supposed to do was basically to indicate as fast as possible whether the sound in the preceding letter actually fell in the name of this picture as well. So, if the sound was present in this picture, they had to press one button, if the sound was not present in this picture, they had to press another. Into other experiments, the pictures were presented slightly earlier than the letter. So, first the picture is coming and then the letters were coming. Here, the experimenter ensured that the participants had no reason to believe that their bilingualism was being tested and that the non-target language Spanish was in any way present in the experimental setup. Now, uh, interestingly, in addition to trials that required a yes response, say for example, if, if I am asking you to uh, monitor for M and the sound of the picture contains the M sound, you will say yes. In addition to these kinds of trials, there were two types of no trials. One in which neither Catalan or Spanish name of the picture carried the sound and the other in which uh, the picture's Catalan name, remember they had to do in, uh, they had to name the pictures in Spanish, in which the picture's Catalan name did not contain the specified sound, but whose name in Spanish actually contained the specified sound. Say for example, I am asking you to monitor for the sound M uh, and you have to name the pictures in Catalan, uh, but the Catalan name does not carry that sound, cat, uh, which is table, taula. Uh, but the uh, name Misa in Spanish carries the M sound. Now, these kind of trials would be slightly harder to reject because we have seen that there is co-activation of the translational equivalence of that concept. So, both Taula and Misa are activated and if the participants are sort of aware of that activation in some sense when they are sort of doing this task, they will find it more difficult to reject uh, the M sound even though it is not really present in the target Taula. So, if the uh, picture's name is actually phonologically encoded in both the languages of these bilinguals, the trials of the second type would be harder to reject for reasons that I just explained. Indeed, in all three experiments, the response types were longer for this second type of uh, no trial, which provides us evidence for the language non-selective phonological encoding. Another experiment was done that investigating the same thing uh, was conducted by Rodriguez for Nelson colleagues in 2005, wherein Spanish German bilinguals and monolingual German speakers were tested and they were presented with pictures and asked to perform a go no go task. So, the idea was when the picture's name contained a particular vowel, they had to push a button, which is a go response, and if it started with the consonant, they had to let it pass without pressing the button, which is the no go response. Alternatively, they had to push the button when the picture's name in the target language started with a consonant and had to withhold a response when it started with a vowel in the non-target language actually. Now, to be able to perform this task, the phonological representation of the picture's name needs to be mentally inspected. For bilinguals, the target language switched between blocks of trials and so for example, on some trials it would be Spanish and sometimes it would be German. Uh, Although for German monolinguals, the task was only in German and they have to just monitor the names in German. Authors in this study collected both, uh, you know, collected three types of responses, behavioral responses, ERP data and fMRI data. Although I will keep, keep my discussion to only behavioral data for, you know, just simplicity purposes. Now, the pictures names, the stimuli, the pictures names were so selected that uh, in half of the trials, uh, the names of these pictures would uh, basically uh, require the same responses in both the languages. So, they either both started with a vowel in both German and Spanish or they started with a consonant in both German and Spanish. On the other half of the trials, uh, the two languages would invite different responses. Say for example, there would be a conflict. Uh, the response uh, uh, starts with a vowel in let us say German and uh, uh, consonant in let us say Spanish. So, the participant will be conflicted as to whether I should press the button or whether I should not press the button. Basically, what would this lead to? It would lead to slowing of the response times.
both the behavioral and the brain data suggested that phonological activation of the non-target language actually takes place because for bilinguals and not for monolinguals, the percentage of correct responses was lower in the coincidence condition and overall bilinguals made more errors and responded more slowly than monolinguals. These findings indicate that the picture's name in the non-target language was also being retrieved at least some of the times, causing interference on the trials where it invited a different response from the non-target response. So this one here is non-coincidence condition, sorry. Now we have seen that, we have seen evidence so far that there is a certain degree of language non-selective phonological encoding also taking place when the bilinguals are preparing to produce words and we have seen that happen through the simple picture naming task. Now, if you remember the model that I have talked about, if you remember that uh, of the levels model of speech production that I am using as the base to explain, uh, you know, uh, these phenomena, uh, we started with conceptual preparation, we went to formulation wherein we did morphological encoding, morphological specification, then we went to syllabification, phonological encoding, phonological word and then finally articulation. Now this is the entire series of steps that are chronologically taken in the levels model, although it is uh, you know a discrete step by step sort of model. Now if you look at this, we have shown that at lexical selection levels, there, uh, there is language non-selectivity. We have seen that at phonological levels, which is at the bottom, there is language non-selectivity. It certainly begs the question that what is happening in the middle? It basically implies if uh, you know you would give that liberty that some kind of language non-selectivity must be happening in the middle stages as well. Say for example at the level of uh, you know morphological encoding and so on. So let us look at this uh, thing in a little bit, little bit more detail which obviously had got researchers also interested because they were interested in looking at whether grammatical encoding is language uh, selective or language non-selective. This might be interesting because if you see at least levels model talks about this existence of this representation called lemmas. Remember when I mentioned that lemmas actually carry both syntactic and semantic information about the concepts that we are talking about. So since the lemmas carry information about the words syntax and also it mediates the conceptual and phonological levels of the production system. if uh, you know, and also since there is evidence for phonological uh, language non-selectivity in phonological encoding, it makes sense for us to assume that there should be some kind of language non-selectivity in the middle stages as well. Let us look deep into this. So uh, there are three studies that I am going to talk about that looked at the assignment of grammatical gender to a word in the response language uh, and whether it is influenced by the gender of its translational equivalent or not. So okay, let us have a look at these studies. Now Rodriguez, Funnels and colleagues had German Spanish bilinguals and German monolinguals perform a go no go task where the go no go de de uh, decision depended upon whether the grammatical uh, gender of the tacitly named word. The participants were required to push a button when the grammatical gender of the picture's name in the response language was masculine and not when it was feminine and vice versa. The pictures were selected such that on half of the trials, the names in both German and Spanish requested the same response and had the same gender, but on the remaining half, uh, the pictures in the two uh, languages had different genders and therefore required different responses. In another study, Costa and colleagues' study, uh, they employed the more common overt picture naming task wherein the participants had to respond with a noun phrase consisting of both a noun phrase and a corresponding definite article, he, her and so on. They tested bilinguals whose two languages had similar grammatical gender systems like Catalan Spanish or Italian French uh, or different uh, gender systems such as Croatian and Italian because Croatian also has neutral gender. Finally, in the third study, uh, they used the same procedures and Costa and colleagues and tested German Dutch bilinguals in uh, on a task of Dutch P L2 Dutch picture naming and included both pictures and names that were Dutch German cognates as well as non-cognate pictures that is pictures with totally dissimilar gender genders in German and Dutch. Let us look at the results. Interestingly, while all three studies were very common and had large uh, similarities, they actually produced disparate results. 
the bilinguals in Rodriguez Fornells uh, and colleagues actually responded slowly on and made more errors on the trials that had different genders in uh, you know uh, the two languages. Uh, and these findings do suggest uh, that an interfering influence from the non-target language is there and thus language non-selective grammatical encoding is a possibility. On the other hand, in none of the five experiments that Costa and colleagues performed, the authors obtained a difference between the same gender and different gender condition. It was basically on chance. Even not when the bilingual two languages had very similar gender systems and in all cases the performance of bilinguals were very similar to that of monolinguals. The authors concluded that this could have been because the two gender systems of, the bi of a bilingual in these two languages are functionally autonomous. Now you see here we are sort of getting different results across these different studies. Uh, on one hand we have Rodriguez von Nelson study where basically you see language non-selective grammatical encoding is happening. On the other hand in Costa's five experiments we are actually seeing no difference between bilinguals and monolinguals performance basically telling us that maybe gender computation in both these languages are independent of each other. Let's look at the third study. Now in Lemofer and colleagues study basically revealed the, that the cognate status of the stimulus materials is also an important variable that could affect their results. These authors obtained clear effects of cross language gender compatibility versus incompatibility much like Rodriguez Fernels and colleagues although they found that these effects were much larger for cognates than non-cognates. So let's say in two out of three studies we see language non-selective grammatical encoding whereas in one study we do not find any evidence for this. Also in this third study we see uh, we find that cognate status because it shares meaning and maybe therefore gender uh, probably sort of confounds the findings that we can take back from here. So to sort of conclude this the few studies that have examined the grammatical encoding in bilingual speech production we can uh, you know we can say that the, uh, the evidence is uh, unequivocal and the findings are not really converging. However, they do at least warrant the conclusion that under certain circumstances grammatical encoding may also be language non-selective such as phonological encoding has been shown to be. That's all that I wanted to uh, uh, talk to you about in this lecture. I'll see you uh, in a different lecture with a different topic. Thank you.